so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. Hey everyone, before we start the show today, I want to let you know that we won't be talking about what is happening since the terrorist attack on Israel a few days ago. The horror of it, as details are starting to emerge of what Hamas did to 1,000 Israeli children and babies and women and the elderly, and the ongoing situation with 150 hostages is just too distressing. It's too traumatic. But that's not to say you shouldn't be aware of it. For Jewish people all over the world, this feels like 9-11 to us. And you certainly didn't need to be American to be gutted by the images that you saw and the stories that you heard around 9-11. But we can't possibly do justice to this topic or our feelings about it on this show in this way at this time. If you're keen to know more though, we will put some links in the show notes, but please take care. And if you have kids in your life, keep them away from social media as much as you can over the next few days, because some things cannot be unseen or unknown. Now, after some very deep breaths and a very big gear shift, on with the show. Hello and welcome to Mamma Mia Out Loud, what women are actually talking about on Wednesday the 11th of October. I'm Mia Friedman and I am driving the school bus while Holly's away. And we're all terrified in the back. I'm Claire Stevens, And I'm Elfie Scott. And on the show today, some people have found a surprising way to deal with loneliness. But the irony is, it's very antisocial. Plus how the bristle effect has been identified as a major killer of intimacy in romantic relationships. So why is it a sex issue for so many women? And have you ever felt sad during life moments that should be joyful? We unpack perfect moment syndrome and why so many of us cry at weddings. But first... In case you missed it, and to be honest, you probably did because you're probably reading more important things at the moment, but Princess Kate got curtain bangs. Catherine, or Kate, the Princess of Wales, has finally given in two to three years after this trend actually emerged and gotten beautiful curtain bangs. She's leaning into her Farrah Fawcett. She's blow drying them out into 70s waves. She's probably seen Harry Styles on tour. They're looking good. Mia, as a fellow Bangs woman, how are you feeling about the new look and are you confident that Kate has copied your style? Look, it's been rumoured. We should probably explain what curtain bangs are for out louders who might not know. Elfie, can you describe a curtain bang? It's a long fringe that sort of goes to the sides of your face much like a curtain. Beautiful. For those out louders who are very keen on a fringe update, I'm growing my fringe out. Yeah, you have very little patience yep. for a fringe. Yeah, someone said that it's like getting a pet, mm. having a fringe, particularly as we head into the summer months. So I'm trying to grow it out, but it's hard. So I'm in the curtain bang phase. I'm growing towards a curtain bang, but my fringe is still straight across. But cowlicks and fringes don't mix. Who well, knew? I feel like I you did. can only have <laughs> curtain bangs if you have your hair professionally blow dried every day. No, all you need is a straightener. Oh. It's actually really easy. I did <laughs> yeah. this this morning. It's or not that bad. See, I think maybe it's just the nature of my hairs. It doesn't fall like that. All I want is to be Sienna Miller. You know how she has oh, those amazing, she has this hair that just mm. falls and she's like, what? And mm. it's like, <laughs> mine always looks awful. Something to put on your to-do list for your maternity leave. Exactly. I'll make curtain bangs work. Are you okay, Emily? What, what did you do to your hair? They're just bangs. Okay, sometimes people cut bangs when everything's fine. It has been two decades since the first podcast was released. Obviously, the medium has upended pop culture and media as we know it. And for heavy users, people who listen while we clean and cook and eat and commute, podcasting has transformed the flavour of our everyday lives. Don't we know it? I know. You're welcome. <laughs> We're part of the problem. No, we are part of the solution <laughs> to media. <laughs> A recent article in the Washington Post called The Nonstop Podcast Listeners Are On To Something described the life of a 29-year-old woman named Kyra who has banished silence from her life. Here's a bit of a recap of Kyra's day. The 29-year-old lives in LA and she wakes up at 6am. She pops in her AirPods and she starts listening to podcasts. She listens to shows about wellness or true crime while she commutes and works her day job as a marketer. Then she heads to her second gig as a workout instructor, podcast playing all the while. She listens while she cooks and winds down for the night and finally she falls asleep 
with a podcast playing. Pellant says the voices help her focus. She says they also feel a social need and that ever since the pandemic, she spent less time with people and working multiple jobs leaves little time for hanging out with friends. So she says the podcast she listens to, and this is what we often say about out loud, it's the friends in your ears. Mm. In recent years, we've also seen the boom of noise-cancelling headphones, which generated $13.1 billion in 2021, and that's expected to triple over the next 10 years. And they're essentially accessories to turn down the volume of real life and, in most cases, fill our ears with our own private alternative realities all day. So what do we think are the consequences of lacking a shared reality? If we're walking around with our own dialogue plugged into our brains Mm. and not listening to the world around us, do we think there's a cost? Hmm. (laughs) (laughs) Look, I think that there is a cost to not living in some semblance of silence. I think that constantly being stimulated is dangerous for a brain. I have become more and more aware of this, particularly with my phone use, but it also extends to podcast listening, where I feel like I can't exist with baseline discomfort. And I think that that is a problem. I've been trying to get over that and just sit in the discomfort of boredom and silence. And I think that that has actually helped me come up with, I was about to say original ideas, but that's probably stretching it, ideas (laughs) sometimes Mm. and thoughts, which I didn't have for many, many months. So that has felt really good. But I also think that there's a social cost to this because I also see people in like supermarkets listening on their noise cancelling headphones and interacting with people. And I think that you often miss out if you're not conscious of it with those kind of incidental interactions with people that can actually make your life feel really full and satisfying in a way, Mm. like speaking to the person at Woolies who's doing the checkout. And when I see those people who keep the noise cancelling headphones on, it makes me want to drag them into the street. Yes. Yeah. It's interesting because I have a very complex relationship with silence and boredom which I've since learned is a lot to do with my ADHD. So boredom for the ADHD brain can feel not just uncomfortable, but like painful is the wrong word. But you know that feeling of like if you're sitting on a remote control and it's just going around or, or like when white noise is just not white noise, it's just static and it's it can feel like really uncomfortable. And so I used podcasts very effectively. And I think probably it's why I got onto podcasts quite early from a media point of view with Mamma Mia, because like I've always liked to have lots and lots of stimulation. So before even the internet was invented, my favorite thing to do when I came home from work in my magazine days would be to have the television on a pile of magazines on my lap while I ate dinner. So it would just be like sensory. And that is relaxing to me to have my senses very, very stimulated. What the experts in this article showed is that everybody needs to be in a certain state of arousal to be able to focus and concentrate. Now, if you've got ADHD, that level is much, much higher. But I've also noticed that the way, you know, the internet has allowed us to, because, you know, you're talking about podcasts or looking at screens as well, has allowed us to fill every gap in our lives. So the part where you walk to the bus stop, the part where you are waiting in a queue, the part where you're walking around the grocery aisle or driving in your car. For a long time, we've had music available to us during those times, but now podcasts are a different kind of stimulation because it's talking. When you're listening to music, your mind can wander, but when you're listening to a podcast, your mind can't wander. And if it does, you have to like skip it back. Exactly. I think that lack of boredom can be really detrimental to creativity Mm -hmm. and even things like critical thinking. Like we should be conscious that the podcast that we're listening to, we're arbitrarily choosing them. So it's another echo chamber. It's putting into our ears what we want to hear. And as a result, you're not necessarily being challenged by little interactions around you or noticing the complexity Mm. of the world around you. I think it also feels like a bit of a Band-Aid solution for loneliness. I talked about this recently when we were talking about group chats and the fact that I haven't been socialising as much and group chats I think I'm using as a bit of a 
very artificial way to mask that loneliness. And I think podcasts do the same thing. You can feel like you've had a million conversations in a week and you haven't had a million conversations. You've listened to other people have conversations. And I don't think the value of that is nearly as important or rewarding as actually being around other humans. But on the upside, doesn't it enable you to have that kind of mental stimulation and that feeling of friendship without having to expend any energy? Like if you are not well or if you are, you know, you can't afford to go out or if you don't have friends. I know it's a facsimile of that social experience, but it also doesn't cost you anything financially or in energy. Listening to podcasts has been something I've realised that that is a way I learn and I absorb information. So I think Mm. overwhelmingly it has added so much to my life. But I think it's the plugging of every moment. It's being in the shower and listening to a podcast. I did that until about a year ago when I moved house and it wasn't feasible. There wasn't anywhere for me to put my phone where it wouldn't get wet. Whereas where I lived before, I could put my phone sort of on the edge of the bath and I could listen to it. And so I literally listened to podcasts all day, every day. And I think that... AirPods have enabled people to do that as well more because you can like move around while you're in a family situation. I listen to you guys while I'm in the shower. (laughs) She says dirtily. I know, I know. I do it as well. (laughs) And I also think what you said, Elfie, about having ideas, it's almost like being plugged with ideas constantly. You can't differentiate. Like I feel like I'm constantly stimulated by information and thoughts and then when I'm asked to have a thought, I have no idea what that (laughs) thought is. But, Elfie, you saw a TikTok trend recently about silent walking. Yes. So it's a concept called silent walking, which to the layperson would otherwise just be dubbed walking. (laughs) Do you ever put your AirPods in to go for a walk with all intentions of listening to a podcast or music or something, but then you just end up listening to the sounds of nature or the cars going by or the water or whatever it is? I literally do this every single day. You know that feeling where sometimes you get the bus or you have to make some kind of journey to work and you forget your headphones and then you have to do the 15 minute walk without headphones and you're like, oh, fuck, God, how am I going to survive? What do people do? Yeah, what did people do? (laughs) Yeah. But I've been doing that recently and I'm really enjoying it. Sometimes your brain will come up with ideas that you find genuinely interesting, (laughs) maybe once a week. It's amazing what your brain can do when you sort of give it that opportunity. But that's why I'm scared of my brain Yeah, because I don't want to think. And in this article, it explained how this particular person, she has intrusive thoughts. She uses podcasts to keep those intrusive thoughts at bay. And for example, this week when the news has just been so horrifying and my brain is just going, going, or if I've got anxiety, which I also do, but anxiety, you can't be anxious while you are thinking about something else, as long as it's not the thing that makes you anxious, the brain can't do two things at once. So if you are distracted with a podcast, it can keep those thoughts out. Yes, but we know that that's not necessarily good in the long term. My question about that is always when you then do have to switch off because you feasibly cannot be plugged in constantly. So, for example, when I go to bed, Mm -hmm. I have to not be listening to a podcast because I'm sharing a bed with somebody who wants to sleep. When I am laying in bed, that's when all the thoughts that probably should have come in. plug them with some AirPods. (laughs) I feel like it's the wave of thoughts that I should have had naturally throughout the day are all Ah. descending on me and then it's 4 a.m. and I'm like, goodness, I really had to work through a lot that I could have have done while I was going through a silent walk. When we were kids and teenagers, silent walking was all you had. So for all the kids out there, make sure you enjoy a silent walk. Clear your head. Out in the trees, in the sunlight, with your... Mamma Mia out loud! One of the biggest intimacy killers in a relationship has been identified in an article in the New York Times this week, and it's called The Bristle Reaction. Sex therapist Vanessa Marin explains in the article that the bristle reaction is what happens when your partner's touch makes your entire body tense or bristle because, as she writes, you know it can mean just one thing. She says that she's noticed it as a trend among her clients who are in long-term relationships. They'd complain to her that their partners would only touch them when initiating sex. So as anyone who's been in a long-term relationship or even a short-term one knows, at the start you want to touch each other a lot, lots of physical touching, lots of affection. 
But then as time goes on, it becomes apparent usually that you and your partner may not want sex or physical affection as often or at the same time as each other. Maybe he likes having sex in the morning, but you want to get up early and go for a run or get to work. Maybe you want to have it at night, but he's too full from dinner. Maybe you just want to cuddle in bed. Myron says this is all normal, but when a pattern sets in and the bristle reaction starts to occur, usually the woman it is who feels that the only time their partner wants to touch them is when they want sex. That's when it can set up this really, really bad dynamic. Elfie, have you been the bristler and or the bristly? Like, can you relate? <laughs> I've probably been the person who makes my partner bristle, but it's not like he's nasty enough to say that out loud. <laughs> but I love this term. I'm so glad that there is a term for this because I've spoken about this with my girlfriends before and everybody knows when their partner is trying to initiate sex. Mm. And it's not even the fact that you don't want sex. Like sometimes you do want sex, but it's just the fact that it's so transparent yes. that makes it embarrassing. Can you give some examples of what kinds of things, and not talking necessarily about your current partner, I don't want to probe into your sex life, even though we've just talked <laughs> even about Even though it. you absolutely do. <laughs> even though, you know, if you really want to share. Um, <laughs> Kathy Lett used to call it the hand, the hand oh, yeah, that would come yeah. across the bed. What are some of the ways that it can make you bristle? Like some of the things that might make one bristle. Touch is definitely a big part of it. Everybody knows when their partner is touching them in a way where they're trying to incite some kind of sexual acts. But then I also like, think... babe, do you want a massage? Yes. Oh, my God. And it's like you don't care about the tension <laughs> no, in my no. shoulder. No person ever wanted to just give their partner a massage. Yeah. But I also think that there are other things that come into this, right? Like some people I've spoken to, like their partners will like light a candle or like close the curtains. And you're like... And then you're <laughs> yeah, it's why is it so irritating? Because men are dirty dogs. <laughs> <laughs> but like, I would almost prefer someone to just go, I really want to have sex with you right now. Because it's like, let's just be grown ups about this. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I think as a busy person, I'm not really that busy, but <laughs> as a person who likes efficiency, sometimes it's like, when there's like a hand movement or a <laughs> fucking candle, it's like, uh, I know this is going to be an hour long expedition. It is a fucking Whereas, candle, isn't it? Yeah. That's what Gwyneth Paltrow should, sa- yeah. should sell a fucking candle. A fucking so candle. So when someone wants to have sex, you light the fucking yeah. candle. Yes. And it's like, I don't need a freaking candle. Like, it's yeah. like, let's just be efficient and direct about this. <laughs> I don't need all the bullshit. But I do think there was some really good advice in this about the bristle reaction and what you're meant to do to kind of combat it. Mm. And one was practicing non-sexual touching, which I reckon this is something I have noticed my whole life about older couples who seem really happy. Mm. I've always looked at older couples, like my parents' generation, who hold hands, who just interact quite physically with each other, obviously not in a sexual way because it's in public. And I reckon there's a direct correlation there between non-sexual touching and happiness. But you don't know in that a they're not rogering like rabbits as well. No, I'm sure they are. But I'm sure they are. they're doing the touching outside of that because yeah. Claire yeah. isn't watching them have sex, yeah. I assume. I don't think I, I don't am. Yeah. And I think the problem becomes when you only touch as a precursor yes. to sex. And it's interesting that there are moments, phases in a relationship where you probably struggle with that and don't struggle with that. So at the moment, like, I'm quite a big hand holder. I quite like holding mm. hands if it's I'm really out sweet. and about. When you're pregnant, like, you are constantly getting your partner to feel your belly, to feel kicks and that sort of thing. And it's like, that's not a sexual, believe me, that is not <laughs> sexual. Or I'm like, rub my back, I'm sore. Rub my feet, I'm sore. And mm. I think that that's good, that it's like there's not a sexual element to it, whereas I know that a lot of people, once they've had babies and they are touched out because you're always with the baby and you you always feel like you're being touched, as soon as your partner puts a hand on you, it's like, oh, get the fuck away. Like, I know <laughs> what this is leading to. Elfie, um, in this article, the sex therapist also suggested establishing erotic time zones. What I think that, I think erotic that time means zone? scheduling when you're going to have sex so that if there's touching outside that time, you can relax into it because you both know that this is not 
a sex time. And she suggests having a conversation about your preferred initiation style and asking each other questions such as, when do you feel most sexual? How can I initiate sex better? And when do you prefer having sex? Oh, it's all about communication. I think those are great ideas, but erotic time zones, would you want it scheduled in? Because that would make me ick even more. If I it's know. like, fuck o'clock, it's five o'clock yeah. on a Friday, we're <laughs> Come going. Come on now. Come on now. <laughs> and it's like, well, maybe I don't feel like that yeah. at that time. Maybe that changes. My favourite is apparently you're meant to say to your partner when you bristle. So, you know, yeah. your mm. partner's touched you, you've just bristled. You're meant to say, oh, sorry, honey, you startled me. Let's circle back to this tonight. Let's circle <laughs> The idea of me saying to my partner, sorry, honey, you've startled me with your touch. You have startled me. I also like, let's circle back to this. Like let's corporate speak. I know. It's fantastic. In a relationship, it's the weirdest thing. This is a very unpopular opinion and probably scientifically wrong, but I feel like some of that over-communication around like, when do you feel most sexual and how can I initiate? I'm like, can't we just vibe? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Let's just yeah, vibe. I get that. <laughs> but I also think that that comes from a place of deep repression yeah, where yeah, you yeah. don't want to talk about no, it. I don't want to talk about it at all. <laughs> you just want to listen to a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> so what do you think? Should we have sex tonight? Ugh. Sounds awful. If you want to make Mum Mia Out Loud part of your routine five days a week, we release segments on Tuesdays and Thursdays just for Mum Mia subscribers. To get full access, follow the link in the show notes and a big thank you to all our current subscribers. Happy birthday to me. Happy birthday to me. Have you ever experienced something that should have been one of your happiest moments? A birthday party, your wedding, a holiday, and found that the reality is just not working out like you expected. It's been called perfect moment syndrome, and basically it refers to the gap between expectation and reality in some of your happiest moments. It afflicts those of us who think life should operate in a certain way and to certain ratios. That birthdays are always happy, that a week in Thailand is meant to be relaxing, that a long-awaited date with your partner at a special restaurant will bring you closer together. So the term was coined by author Sarah Wilson, and it's hit a chord with a lot of people on TikTok. TikTok this week who are talking about how it affects their relationships, holidays, formals, basically anything in their lives that should feel good but just does not. Experts are weighing in on perfect moment syndrome with some pointing out that people can be scarred by traumatic histories where bad things were shown to naturally follow good things. So anxiety or distress is a natural reaction to things going well. But it can also come down to black and white thinking, disproportionate expectations and a lack of understanding of what will truly make you happy in any given situation. Claire, as somebody who has never deeply examined the concept of happiness or moments of disappointment and also never launched a chart-topping podcast about this literal exact topic. <laughs> what are your thoughts on perfect moment syndrome and have you ever had it? I love this concept because it's essentially what my podcast, But Are You Happy, is about. And we, we, ask, and we <laughs> ask guests for a time the world told them they'd be happy and they weren't. And the answers are always fascinating. I think Instagram slash social media has a huge part to play in this because the idea of flattening life experiences to an image is something I don't think we've explored enough, the impact that that has on our expectations and on how we expect things to be emotionally. Like we were talking a few weeks ago about the influencer who was in Europe. This occurred like, to me yes. immediately <laughs> as well. I was like, guys, there's like cues and there's rubbish on the street. And it's like, yeah, because the beautiful image that you've seen, that's a 360 actual living, breathing moment. That's not just a flat image. So I've had lots of these moments, which is what inspired the podcast and why I was interested in this topic. At the moment, for example, I have always looked forward to pregnancy. I look to people like Meghan Markle holding her bump at those awards. Remember, like everyone made fun of mm. her, but I was like, oh, I don't know, I'd love to hold my bump. I hate pregnancy. I hate it. I absolutely hate it. Probably the biggest mm. example was Jesse's wedding day. So it was something I looked forward to my entire life and then I was sick, which is something that happens in life. 
is that sometimes those moments they just don't happen or they just don't work out the but way that you perfect think. Perfect moment syndrome. Maybe I've misunderstood what it is. I thought it was about not because you cry because you're disappointed that it's not what you'd hoped that it would be, but more that feeling of I'll often cry in happy moments and it's always connected to a loss because with a lot of milestone happy moments like your child's wedding, for example, Mm. I cried with happiness but also because I was crossing a threshold into him, you know, that next phase of life, Mm. into letting go and stepping back and, and on my daughter's last day of school. I was so happy but I was also very emotional because there was also a letting go and a sort of a looking back. To me, it's the nostalgia of tearfulness, not of Mm. mismatched expectations. Is that different to perfect moment syndrome? I think it might be because Mm. I think that what you're describing is where you're living in a moment and you're able to like reflect seriously Mm. on the implications of that moment. Whereas I think that perfect moment syndrome more reflects a kind of delusion, the mismatch between reality and what your expectations are. Or our lack of understanding that like the way life works is that even the most perfect day of your life is going to have disappointments and even the crappiest day of your life is going to have silver linings. Like like it's sort of that really black and white, all or nothing thinking that means that when we get to these moments, and I think it's just especially true of young people, that, you know, you get to your wedding day or you get to your year 12 formal and you think that it's going to be this absolutely perfect thing and it's absolutely not because nothing is. Do you think that's why a lot of people feel very sad on Christmas Day? Mm. You can never recapture if you had a good Christmas when you are a kid. You can never recapture the joy of that. It's always a disappointment, particularly when you have to sort of and I think do all it's, the work. Yeah. I and I think that Christmas Day is like the pinnacle of Christmas time. So it's like you've got this whole season <laughs> that's building up to a day and then you get you wake up on the day and you're like, I'm a bit tired and cranky. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Like, like you're kind of faced with the reality that like this is not magic, this is just life. I think the other part of this, and and I spoke to um, Hugh Van Kylenberg about this in an episode of But Are You Happy that drops tomorrow, is this idea of life seasoned, which you guys have spoken about on this podcast. And we sort of expect life seasons to be either completely happy or completely not. And there are people who look mm. at a particular life season and anticipate For example, it's a big reason for postnatal depression that people look at, you know, I'm going to have a baby and I'm going to be the happiest I've ever been. And that's a huge thing that then plays into the mental health issues that can arise. I was talking to Hugh Van Kylenberg about this and the fact that, you know, I was like, but what about when you just absolutely hate it and I'm only pregnant because I want a baby and I actually hate this phase? He had some beautiful lines about in your favourite book there will be chapters you don't like. And in your favourite chapter, there will be sentences you don't like. Mm. And also in the crappest chapter of a book, there will be great sentences. Like you've really got to kind of play with that nuance of like having gratitude for goodness in bad times and appreciating that in the best times, the most magical times, there are going to be imperfections. Elfie, can you think of times that you've had perfect moment syndrome? I don't think that this is something that troubles me because I have very low expectations (laughs) of a lot of things. Cynicism is great. (laughs) (laughs) But I have to say that my partner has been very good at getting me to voice when I am feeling discomfort that is putting me in a grump. Mm. And I think being able to pinpoint that and laugh at it because ultimately it's always going to be like it was a good day but it was very windy yeah (laughs) it's like it really makes you laugh at yourself and how unbelievably fickle you can be when you are just in a cranky mood and I think that that can really interrupt a good day but I really love that idea Claire because I think that a lot of this is also just about relinquishing control and not being perfectionist and yeah having a very realistic idea of what the world and life is like Birthdays have felt like that to me. I've now managed to remove all my expectations for birthdays after having so many terrible, terrible birthdays. 
happy birthday. Like, and it's like you're meant to feel, I don't know mm. what. I always feel like I'm getting my feelings wrong on my birthday. Yeah, yeah. Like I think it's that you feel like your own emotions can never live up to what they're meant to. Yeah. On but a then certain, where does the meant to come I don't from? Know. Is it what we digest in I think movies it's or social media? Yeah, I think it everyone's is performing. Yeah. I think, <laughs> is everyone performing birthdays? I think they are. Yeah, it's a weird thing. <laughs> I don't think anyone, I don't know what you're meant to feel on your birthday. I've never felt it. I also, on those big moments where you're meant to feel a lot, I'm always paralysed with nothing, with just numbness. Like the day I got engaged, each of the days I had my babies, I never felt that I was feeling what I was meant to feel. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what I was meant to feel, but it, that wasn't it. And to me, my happiest times, like on Friday night, that was not any special occasion, but I had all my family over, you know, someone was holding Luna and the kids were teasing each other and laughing and someone was in the kitchen. And it was like, my heart was so full in that moment, but it was like, I had no expectations for that exactly. night. But I think that you're also tapping into this idea that we are so built to believe that our moments of happiness should be moments of ecstatic joy. And I think actually what happiness boils down to is contentment, right? Mm. Mm. And that heart full feeling. And it's not like it's going to feel like fireworks. A lot of the time it will just feel like fulfillment. Out Loud is coming to the Facebook group and let us know when you've had perfect moment syndrome. We want to know the moment why it didn't live up to expectations, and how you've sort of processed it afterwards. Before we go, I have a recommendation, and it is for a bedtime story. It's been a long time since I've read or listened to a bedtime story, thank God. Jessie and Claire Stevens have done a very special bedtime story for Luna. Here is a little bit of it. Your mummy and your auntie are going to read you a book called the voice referendum we're voting on whether indigenous and torres strait islander people should get a say in the policies and laws that affect them very good question luna well the no sides say that not every single indigenous person in australia was consulted about the voice yes that would be literally impossible and also it overlooks that this, this was an idea that came from Indigenous people. They convened and they came up with this idea. It's so good. You'll get to see Luna being so cute. You guys are so funny. How did you come up with this idea? It's a reel that you've done. It's on TikTok. It's on Instagram. How did you come up with the idea? We had this idea weeks and weeks ago to do this and then we tossed up whether to say anything, do anything. Are you entitled to have an opinion on this? And then we sort of landed on the fact that both of us would feel really weird the day after the referendum mm -hmm. if it got to that and we hadn't said anything, if we hadn't even attempted to change minds mm. or show a perspective. And so we kind of thought, like, what's a way to do it that has a very low-level emotional entry point, which is little baby <laughs> And that, and that was funny. Hopefully, uses humor rather than yelling at people. Mm. I, like I also didn't want to, you know, write something that was angry or could get misconstrued. Or or, exactly, or, yeah. exactly. So we thought we'd just do this, and there's been some interesting conversations in the comments, and overwhelmingly, the response has been lovely. Yeah, I loved it. It's so funny. Out loud as we'll put a link in the show notes. Check it out. Oh, so good. If you're looking for something else to listen to, on yesterday's subscriber episode, Holly, Mia and I had a fight about money. We discussed if there is a point people reach where they're making too much money. Mm. Because on a subscriber episode last week, we sort of got to this point in a conversation about Taylor Swift and Mia called Holly and I out for thinking that women are greedy <laughs> for making too much money. And so we decided to just unpack that entire fight. And it's very personal. It's interesting. Yeah, it got really heated. It was revealing. Like I learned things about you both that I didn't know, and maybe you would say the same. You know, money is such a contentious topic. I'm really glad we did it. Yeah, we've had some great feedback. So a link to that episode will be in the show notes. 
Thank you for listening to Australia's number one news and pop culture podcast. You might be in the shower. Hello. You look lovely. <laughs> or going to the toilet. <laughs> this episode was produced by Emmeline Gazillas. The assistant producer is Tali Blackman with audio production by Leah Porges. We'll be in your ears tomorrow. Bye. 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 Shout out to any Mum Mia subscribers listening. If you love the show and want to support us, subscribing to Mum Mia is the best way to do so. There's a link in the episode description.